I am here with Dr. Gilda Carl, who's the media's go-to relationship expert and corporate performance coach serving clients worldwide. As a media personality, uh, she was the in-house therapist on TV's Sally Jesse Raphael show, as well as on every other talk show on national television. In the corporate sector, she's conducted wellness, uh, relationship wellness training for Columbia University Medical Center, as well as other medical facilities, banking institutions, utility companies, entertainment organizations, and uh, Fortune 50 uh, companies. As a recognizable, trusted, and accessible professional, she's also a product sp spokesperson for large companies that want to partner with her followers. She's like Hallmark, uh, Sprint, I, the list goes on and on, Match.com, I know. Uh, a, a keynote uh, motivational speaker, she includes wisdom from the 17 relational books uh, she's authored, I should say relationship books she's authored, including Don't Bet on the Prince, which was a test question on Jeopardy, which is interesting, How to Win When Your Mate Cheats, and uh, don't lie on your back for a guy who doesn't have yours. And I could go on and on other stuff that you have done, Dr. Gilda, but I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you. It's such a pleasure being here with you. I love the names of your books, by the way. They're, they're, they're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was looking at your uh, profile, and I want to read this because I think it's my favorite quote uh, uh, of some of the things that have written about you, and this is too funny to me. TV's number one talk show therapist hotter than the Sierra, part philosopher and part stand-up comic. Is that your favorite? <laughs> yeah, I love that one. I love that one. That was, that was the Gannett uh, newspaper chain. That's um, great. I, I, I love that one because in a moment, in, in just that little soundbite, they captured who I am. I'm funny and, and fun, and yet I'm very serious. And so I've mixed them all together, and voila! <laughs> You, you are fun, and we've had fun getting to know each other. Yes, and we're still getting to know each other. Yes. I love it. This is, this is fun, because I feel like I know you well, you know, compared to some people that are on my show. Aren't? Yeah, and I, I think I want to start, well, I want to get into some different areas, but I, I want to talk about how you got into being a media personality, if we could start with that, because I was watching you on uh, Joy Behar's show. You're so funny, and you, you were getting that guy's goat, <laughs> and you were, you, you, you're very spunky and you keep it fun and you're not just get there giving the answers, you know what I mean? And it takes a special uh, personality to, to do that. Yes, somebody who doesn't care, yeah. <laughs> throws it out to the wind and says, I am going for the greatest good, for the greatest number, and no matter what, I will do it. And how many times, like uh, when I spend time on the Sally Jesse Raphael show, how many times the director would come running after me after a show and he'd say, Dr. Gilda, will you please stay in our light? I said, but somebody on the other end of the stage needed me. So <laughs> I'm going where I am needed. And sometimes I ran off the stage and into the audience and, and I took the mic and I interviewed people in the audience when need be. So, I, you know, I always did what I did. And all of that uh, devil may care attitude mm -hmm. won me an opportunity to do my own talk show. Uh, I remember that I was called into uh, the guy's office, the guy who was overseeing the Sally Jesse Raphael show, NBC TV, national, international. I was getting fan mail from people in other countries. And, and, and the guy said to me, all that I know is that when you are on, people don't change the channel. Right. Now, I realize it's a business, mm -hmm. and I am a commodity. And I recognize that. So he said, not would you like, <laughs> but we're giving you your own show. And I remember walking out of his office, it was freezing cold January day, and I was walking on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, and I called my mother and I said, the most bizarre thing just happened. I didn't ask for this. I just did the best work on camera, on stage, with the people in front of me that I could ever possibly do. And that's been my philosophy of life. So you ask how I started. Yeah, how yeah. it all started. Uh -huh. You know, I was teaching in the South Bronx in the worst neighborhood you could imagine wow. in the country. 
Mm -hmm. And again, devil may care. I wore my little tiny dresses mm -hmm. and with my legs sticking out. Okay. And I, I mean, I was in the worst areas and I was totally without fear. And I learned to deal with those kids without fear. And I took many of them and, and brought them to a place that everybody else had given up on. And that made me feel great. So I did that for a lot of years. While I was doing that, I was uh, getting my PhD, well, getting my master's degree. I, was, I graduated from college at 20. I had my master's at 20. Oh. I was in this rush for some reason. And I said to myself, I'm going to get my PhD by the time I'm 30. And I did it. Wow. Then I said, now what? <laughs> but life has a way of, of taking us uh, on different courses. Mm -hmm. and, and you can plan all you want. But I do believe that God up there has a plan for us. No matter what we do to try to screw it up, it happens nonetheless. And um, while I was teaching in the South Bronx and while I was got, getting my doctorate, Suddenly I had a, a job offer to go to a college and teach on the college level. And I said, this could be good. Mm -hmm. And because all my courses were at night, I had the ability to start appearing on daytime talk shows. I, you know, I, I just one thing led to another thing to another thing. And the first year I did about six shows national shows mm -hmm. and by the second year i had done way over a hundred wow. and by the third year people were asking me uh let's do a pilot together let's do a show of our own because the dr gilda name is reverberating throughout the world and and so suddenly i had a different kind of career mm -hmm. what i got my phd for was to become a college professor right so, right so that allowed me to teach at night go through a divorce, <laughs> go through all of those pains. Mm -hmm. And while I was going through my own pain, I was healing the world on camera, on television. Mm -hmm. And I was able to take some of the stuff that I was going through and to share that with other people and to become far more appreciative of their issues as a result of my own. So I, so I ended up on television for all these years. And in addition to all of that, mm -hmm. corporate America found me. And they asked me to come in and run communications workshops. Uh, I did all kinds of training. I ended up in all kinds of companies, Fortune 500 companies, small businesses. I, I did... Uh, communication skills training for partners. I did that that kind of performance coach counseling, and I saved some companies from going under. Suddenly, the bottom line in all these companies was going up. And I know in one in one instance, I was a 55 Wall Street for Citibank, and they called me in uh, to work with their customer service people who were so burnt out. And they asked me to run a program dependent upon the needs of the people. And, and, and so I did a needs assessment first. Mm -hmm. And I told the director who, and he had not brought me in. It was, it, was, it was a few of his staff people who had seen my reputation, heard about my rep reputation. And uh, I said to the director, all I know is that by the time this is over. This, this work, these workshops are over. Your people will like coming to work a whole lot better. And he said, I don't care whether they like coming to work. Oh. And I said, with all the moxie of a New Yorker, <laughs> and young and stupid, <laughs> no, what am I going to do? Um, I said, yes, you do. And I don't know what happened be between my mm -hmm in there and the big check that he wrote me to do this training but it worked and I was in there for 10 weeks 
I designed a program specifically according to the needs that I had observed. And their bottom line went crazy. And before that happened, people were teeter-tottering about their communications and their relationships. Mm -hmm. And I, after this program, every other division at that company asked me to come in and do the same thing for them. So mm -hmm. what, was, what had started out to be a few weeks of a program mm -hmm. at that company it turned out to be a few years uh, of a program. So, I, so every time I plan something, now I write everything in pencil because, <laughs> because I know I'm going to need that eraser to, uh -huh. erase, to erase for things that I really should be doing. And through all this, I have met the most wonderful people and uh, it's, it's just, been, just been wonderful. And I'm working on a few projects now uh, that I'm not talking about yet, uh, but they're out from the East Coast, mm -hmm. and they will be, of course, national slash international, as we know it, because when we use the, um, the media today, thanks to the internet, mm -hmm. we can see things and hear things that uh, we would never have been exposed to years ago. So I'm very grateful to be alive during this time of year, of this time of my life, during this time of uh, uh, the, the universe. <laughs> they take us. Well, it's interesting how just one thing led to the other. And that's how a lot of people, you know, you never know what door is going to open until you do one thing. It opens the door to something else. But what opened the first door for you? I mean, I have a lot of people who listen to the show who would love to follow in your footsteps. I mean, they're consultants. They're, you know, they want to be on maybe uh, broadcast shows where they can be seen as the expert like you were. Uh, you're the behavioral person, you know, relationship person. How did you get that first initial break? And what would you tell somebody who's trying to do that same thing you did? This is very simple when I look back. Of course, while you're going through it, you have no idea what you're doing. Right. Uh, it's very simple. One of the headlines was, a uh, former teacher in South Bronx teaches street smarts. Ah. Companies. Mm -hmm. So you go from where you know. You mm -hmm. go from where you came from. And then you take that and mm -hmm. apply that to the next level to which you're ascending. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. So I was in corporate America training them in street smarts. I was on network television training people in the same basic street smarts, right. but then all the, all the things that we talk about in terms of interpersonal communications and relationships. So everything started to help everything else. My PhD in educational leadership, all the leadership theories, all the leadership work that I had done, mm -hmm. I used that. I used all my clients who I have, I currently have clients from around the world, thanks to the internet, mm -hmm. simply by going to drgilda.com and, and clicking on advice, uh, slash coaching, people come to me and register for a quickie session with me. Mm -hmm. And I really believed, having had therapy, having been through that myself, I really believe that when we are in need, we need not have to wait a whole day or three days or four days to see the advisor or their doctor to get our problems healed we can right. go like immediately. So I have allowed my life to be encroached upon <laughs> by my clients very easily mm -hmm. because they can reach me and I can reach them back wherever I may be. And I have done some interventions while I was traveling on vacation, while I was, I mean, it, you wow. wouldn't believe it. And it's only half hour here, half hour there. Many people register for 10 sessions at a time to save some money and, and to get the coaching continuous. Mm -hmm. But when somebody is having a real issue and they want to talk to somebody now, right. I, as, as with what I do, I want to be available for them. So everything that I have learned just built on everything else. And let me tell you something, Dr. Diane, we know <laughs> We know that people in uh, Australia, 
people in Europe, people in uh, South America, people across the United States who come to me with their relationship issues, bedroom to boardroom, mm -hmm. people know that I know what I'm talking about and they can trust me. But we all have the same problems. And I learn as much from my clients as they learn from me. And I'm delighted to be, I'm really grateful to be in this place, to be able to heal and help people towards the next step in their life. Well, you're kind of ahead of your time with a lot of these topics. I mean, as far as like engagement, <laughs> emotional intelligence, yeah, that's the kind of stuff you're dealing with, right? Yes. So yeah. when it all became so popular, were you like, oh, I already been talking about that for 20 years. Oh, that again? Oh, that again? Okay, so they're putting new bows and, and right. ribbons on uh -huh. these terms. But, oh, yeah, I've dealt with that. I continue to deal with that. I know that. Uh -huh. It all comes down to communication. And you and I were talking about what we were going to talk about today. And I kind of want to talk about male-female communication in the workplace because everybody's a little freaked out about that right now. A little freaked out. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. Harvey yeah. Weinstein, meet mm -hmm. fearless girl. That's the kind of work that I've been doing lately. I mm -hmm. took the statue, the fearless girl statue from Wall Street and with our hands on hips and, and I, I had put out a poster on social media saying, Harvey Weinstein, meet fearless girl. And it's my job now to show women, young and old, that they need not fear anything. When you are fearful, you are holding yourself back. You are sabotaging yourself. You are preventing yourself from rising. So we have got to get rid of the fear. And the fear is what's causing all of our insecurities with everything. What's the worst that could happen to any of us? Listen, I've been on, I, I've been on in the media for so many years now. It's open mouth, insert foot. People say, she said what? And then the ratings climb. Uh -huh. Nobody knows what to expect from me. And before you know it, they offer me a TV show. So go figure <laughs> I mean, there was days in the olden days, and I, I spoke to my mom before she passed, and I said to her, do you remember when you kept saying, Ma, do you remember when you said to me, Gilda, you have such a big mouth. I'm putting soap in that mouth. You are so, so, so fresh. And I said, you know all that soap? It didn't do a bit of good, did it? I'm earning my living this way. That's so funny. Well, do you ever regret saying anything? Have you ever said anything and you go, oh, and that's come back to bite you? I have always regretted something that I have said on television until I, and I say, oh my God. And I always imagine in my mind it's worse than ever. Mm -hmm. and, and when I watch it, it wasn't so bad. Mm -hmm. But I always mm -hmm. say, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> There are times that I just, I can't hold myself back, it seems. I've got, I'm always in there for the underdog. I'm always, I mean, this is why I, I opened a nonprofit for homeless female veterans. Nobody oh. talks about female veterans. Nobody talks about homeless female veterans. They have, they have gotten such a, a the short end of the stick. And so I, of course, had to go out there and, and do workshops for these homeless female veterans. And I have put them to work. I am training them to train other homeless female veterans. And I have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and I have taken them off the street and, and, I've got, and they've gotten jobs, fabulous jobs. Many of the homeless female veterans are college educated and we don't even know that in our culture. And so I just kind of like take their hand and show them that there's a better way. Talk about insecurity. These women come out of the military tough and strong and many are angry because nobody has been helping them. You know, they're, they're taken care of womb to tomb in the military and then they come right. out and then what? No, yeah. they right. plunge them down yeah. and, and they have, they don't know where to go. So um, hmm. I, whatever I do, I do this with the lyrics and music of country music. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. That's an interesting thing. Tell, tell me what you're doing with that. Well, I've always been a devotee of country music because they tell, 
country music tells stories. Right. And um, there was one, one MD who's also a PhD, uh, Hawk, David Hawkins. Are you familiar with his work? I got to think about that one. What, what is, remind me. He's a psychiatrist. Uh -huh. and, and he, he measures the vibrations of the tones of how you're hmm. speaking. It's kinesiology. Uh -huh. He has found that people who listen to country music are more evolved than other people. And this wow. is surprising to me hmm. because I see that you tell the story, you put it to words, or you put it to music, and then voila, people are identifying with this. And here are the closed down veterans who for the most part won't open up to an outsider except thankfully my celebrity allowed them to recognize me and they said, oh my God, I can't believe you're here. And so it was instant trust. Uh -huh. So I played them some of this music mm -hmm. and they, they just, they said, oh my goodness, this happened to me, this happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then we start our dialogue. Right, right. And it's just so beautiful to see them open up like flowers. Well, that, that's an interesting uh, way to go. I mean, you, you've gone in so many directions. I, I, that, uh, what else? The, the HBO, you were on this Emmy Award winning <laughs> show, right? It wasn't that featured on Oprah or something like that. And yeah. I, yeah. Well, what, okay, so how did you, that was a serious thing too that you did, right? Yeah, that, was, that was hard. Very, how did, t tell me a little about that. It was after 9-11. Uh, and, uh, you know, New York was so crazed. Um, and, and a director who I had barely known called me and he said, we need you. I'm doing a documentary. Uh, I said, I, I, I can't do this. I, I can't, I can't participate in anything right now because I haven't healed. And if I'm not healed, what good am I going to be to other people? And he said, we need you. We need you. We really need. And he eventually kept calling me. And he eventually wore me down. So I said, okay, let's see what we have. We went into a house that he had found on Staten, Staten Island, where there were so many people who had lost their lives, who had families who had lost their lives. And there was a little seven-year-old boy who had not, who had just lost his mother. Mm. His mother was separated from his father. The father was not a custodial parent. So now the father was going through all kinds of change, changes. Oh my, all the guilt trip that he had to go through in, in, in involving what should I have told my, my former partner? Mm -hmm. What should I have said? Could we have worked harder on the relationship? And now here's the seven-year-old boy. So anyway, so I led the family to tell their seven-year-old child that his mother had died in the World Trade Center. Oh. And this was, I can't even watch this, and it's shown every, it, it, HBO picked it up, and, uh, and it's showed, shown on every uh, anniversary of 9-11, and I can't watch it anymore. It's, it's, har it's too hor horrifying to me. But I kept in touch with the family, and uh, this young boy started to grow up, when I wasn't around, uh, and and he tried to commit suicide a couple of times, wow. not knowing where his life was going. But I I had a good sit down with his father and and him uh, some years back, and we talked about all the trials and tribu tribulations they had been through, and it was fascinating. But anyway, so that so that that movie won an Emmy. I didn't want to do it originally and uh oprah highlighted it on one of her shows and um it was a point in history that i would rather forget wow. but but that was very serious but you know a producer in new york said nobody can go from dateline to howard stern the way you do <laughs> and that's because you know i go with the moment right i'm very interested in the mood of the audience mm -hmm. and that's how i provide media training to all of the people i work with mm -hmm. uh it all depends upon the audience it's not us 
It's the audience. And I pick up on that and go with that. Well, okay. So your audience, let's say you had to be on the Today Show tomorrow. Mm -hmm. how, how, how would you prepare? What would you talk about? What would be your focus? Well, I've been on the Today Show. I know. <laughs> oh, You've been everywhere. I have. I really have. And I've been, um, and I, I wrote for two years, I wrote a weekly column for the Today Show called oh. 30 Second Therapist. Mm -hmm. So I, I know the Today Show pretty well. Um, I, if I did not know that show, mm -hmm. I would ask, what are the demographics? People don't, you know, guests come on, they don't even ask what the demos are. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, for the Today Show, you're providing information for women who go up to maybe 60 years old, mm -hmm. and people don't know that. So you have to go according to what their needs usually are. And you have to know what you're talking about. Right. So, so that's, that's just an example. Mm -hmm. Well, it's such a broad audience on some of these things. And, and you talk about so many different areas. I mean, you talk about communication, but you talk about it in so many different ways. Right. Well, because, because there are a lot of people quote, experts out mm -hmm. there saying that they're relationship experts mm -hmm. who know nothing about corporate America, who have never worked in a corporation, who don't know anything about the ups and downs and the ins and outs and the sickness to sin behavior mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of, of the people who are operating in companies. Mm -hmm. And yet, here are these, quote, relationship experts talking to people about their relationships, people are not only put into a little category of tiny relationships without broadening their base right. into the corporate relationships or into their family relationships or into their brothers and sisters and neighbors and all the other people who are involved in their lives. Mm -hmm. So when people say, I'm a relationship expert, oh, that means I went out on a date once. <laughs> Please, give me a break. No, to be a relationship expert, you really have to know how relationships work, but you also have to identify with the most important, you have to identify with the most important relationship of all, and that is the relationship that you have with yourself. And I do this whole thing with audiences mm -hmm. because I do all these keynote speeches these days. And with the audiences, I ask them to introduce themselves. I am Dr. Gilda. So I ask them, I say, okay, come on, introduce yourself. I am Dr. Gilda. And you hear this yeah, anemic <laughs> kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of vo voice all together yeah. uh -huh. um, and and I said no 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 you know what that I sounded like a lower case I mm -hmm. I want to hear that I am Dr. Gilda with a capital I and all of a sudden you see in front of you the whole audience levitating yeah. I say that that capital I is what you must go out after this after we're finished here, you must go out into the world and use and visualize and project your capital I. You cannot say, I am president of this company, unless you know the meaning of capital I. Well, you know, it's interesting. I had a, a guest on that was talking about how um, he was saying that uh, speakers are taken more seriously if they're tall. And that's why men tend to be, you know, better speakers, in his opinion. And, uh, you know, and I'm thinking about what you're saying now, because it's bringing to mind, he said, well, you know, Tony Robbins wouldn't be what he is, maybe if he wasn't who, you know, as big as he is, maybe Howard Stern wouldn't be what he was, if you know, and, and that was this what his way of thinking. I would love to hear you tear that guy <laughs> apart. I want to hear what you have to say about that. Get him on air. Let's have a little Let's have at it. <laughs> <laughs> what can women do it, it, to be more a capital I, like you're saying? If, if Is there anything that they need you know, to know? The first time I tried out that whole theory, mm -hmm. it was in New York, and I was running a women's breakfast called How to Project a Power Image because I've done a lot of writing and I toured the country doing workshops, speeches on 
how to project a power image. And this morning, in the heart of Manhattan, Madison Avenue, there we were, standing room only, and I was doing training for these women during their breakfast on how to project themselves with the capital I, how to expand, put their, put their arm on the, against, <laughs> not, not like this, because these, these uh, chairs are too big. Okay. Can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, work on me. Let's let's fix this. Cut this down to size. Cut this down. <laughs> when you're when you're sitting when you're sitting in a ballroom chair, right? You put your arm out, so that takes up much more space. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're sitting, certainly not on a subway, but when you're sitting, women tend to cross their legs and to look more diminutive mm -hmm. than they actually are, almost as though they are shrinking into the lowercase i. Mm -hmm. So what I do is expand their persona, mm -hmm. and, and the persona starts in their mind, then their body, mm -hmm. and, and in their eyes. I do this thing that I, I it's, this is all in my book, um, don't bet on the prince. How mm -hmm. to have the man you want by betting on yourself. Mm -hmm. That has been used by men and women. How to have the career you want by betting on yourself. How to have the job you want by betting on yourself. That's mm -hmm. a subtitle. Mm -hmm. But the point of this is don't bet on the prince. Don't bet on somebody else to take up your space. Mm -hmm. Don't bet on anybody doing anything for you. Get out there and do it for yourself. So after these women were finished, mm -hmm. standing room only, I taught them how to do the power stare. Mm -hmm. And that, that too is in my book, mm -hmm. Don't Bet on the Prince. And then I said to them, do I trust you ladies to go out onto the mean streets of New York mm -hmm. and kill it? Do <laughs> I trust you women? I don't know if we can let you loose. Uh -huh. That's the cute. <laughs> and they, they applauded. I mean, they were just, they, they were, it was amazing. And I had a line of women as they, I said, okay, ladies, work time. Bye. <laughs> Nine o'clock was over and they were off to their, to their jobs. But I had a line of women standing back waiting to talk to me about how to do this better, how to do that better. I mean, all the kinds of coaching that I do. And these days, I do everything online. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to be in front of a person. So right. it's, it's really incredible. You just keep using one thing and, and putting it into another arena and changing it according to the people who need it. Now, I started out doing personal relationships, mm -hmm. but it was in corporate America that a man came up to me and he said, I have to really thank you, Dr. Gilda, because if not for you, my relationship at home would never have been as intact as it is. And I said, but we didn't even talk about your relationship at home. <laughs> all right. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. It is. And it then, is. As you see, you know that, I know that, mm -hmm. I didn't know that then. Right. And and so I said, oh my. And that's when I started getting more and more and more into the Fortune 500 companies doing what I do. Well, you, you have such an interesting, diverse background of all the different things you do. And, and I, I agree that you can take one thing and it applies somewhere else. But it's all the same. It is I'm all the same. Just, I'm, I'm not talking about finance. Right, right. <laughs> I'm talking always. Your personal okay. skills, communication. Relationships right. and communications. Yeah, right. Well, I'm wondering, you know, you said that when you, you know, how you got started and things that you, you just weren't, you don't seem like you would be intimidated by uh, Sally Jesse or Oprah or, or, or Howard or, or were you ever worried maybe going on Howard that he was going to ask you something that you didn't want he to did. ask? Because he's known to ask some questions. He did. <laughs> Oh, I'm, yeah. not gonna, I'm not going to repeat what he asked here. <laughs> yeah, you probably can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. Did you, did you answer him? <laughs> <laughs> I sure did. I sure did. And then I saw him on the street one day, and I said, you know, I saw you and your wife crossing the street uh, last week. He said, so why didn't you stop? I said, I know. You know, I, I, I just like, I don't like when people come up to me on the street. Mm -hmm. I don't like to give you guys your space. I, I like, I appreciate it you know, getting my space also. Right. Well, did... Yeah, go ahead. You no, know, I'm just saying, did, did, he, did you ever feel like if you answer his questions, 
that it, if it's impro it's problematic or, uh, you know, an issue in some other area, you know, you don't want to be seen one way because you got to be somewhere else. And in the business world, you, you got to be careful of, of uh, like, we go back to the communication. Oh, really? You have to be careful of <laughs> hearing about what's going on in some, right. of, these, some of these businessmen? Oh, okay. really? Uh, oh, really? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I know. I have never been fearful of anything. I answer certain things more judiciously than mm -hmm. others, depending upon what the arena is. Right, right. Everybody knows me. And that's why companies come to me and ask me to be their spokesperson. Because everybody knows. I'm totally honest. They know that I am not representing a product. Harlequin, Hallmark, uh, Cottonelle, Sprint. I mean, Galderma yeah. Pharmaceuticals. I mean, no. everybody knows I am not representing a product unless I believe in it. Mm -hmm. And I am not working with people who I don't appreciate for being stand-up people. So, I mean, people, my audience, my audience around the world knows that they can trust me. I mean, who are you going to hire to represent your product if not somebody you can trust? Right. Well, you were um, matched for a while, right? You were- Oh yeah, I was, yeah, I, I was writing for Match for eight years. I wrote the uh, Ask Dr. Gilda column mm -hmm. and that was, oh my goodness, that was so successful. Mm -hmm. And um, it was it was great gig. What kind of things did you deal with in your column? I mean, what-, what... I, I answered questions. Mm -hmm. What were the loved... interesting kind of questions? Did you get anything that just, you went, wow? <laughs> You know, at this point, look, having been, having worked in the South Bronx, having <laughs> worked in corporate America, having, having done all kinds of television shows mm -hmm. that I, I, you would never even remember anymore because some of them were on the air and off the air mm -hmm. in two seconds. Mm -hmm. um, but having done all of these things, I'm never surprised at anything. You know, I was also MTV's love doc. No. <laughs> and so I heard questions from young people, from their parents, from older people. I was the only place that they went to. And I'm still the only place that people feel comfortable in coming to, to answer their issues at work and their issues at, in, in their personal lives. So I, I, I always hear very similar questions. Yeah. How can I get him to commit? How can I just said this on a nationally broadcast TV show um, just just the other day here? Uh, I said, you know, the millennials are coming to me and saying the young women are saying that the guys are not wooing and pursuing them, and I'm saying, well, you know what, Mama was right. <laughs> Why give her away? the cow right. when when you're getting the milk for free why yeah. buy, i'm sorry like why buy the cow when oh, you yeah. get the milk for free right so uh you know it's it's so this is you it's the same issues again and again if it's the young millenn the millennials the young millennials the older millennials it's the same issue it's mm -hmm. all around yes relationships communication but the bottom line is the crux of this and that is our empowerment well it, it is interesting to see how technology has impacted the communication i mean if you're they're oh. on tinder or whatever and they're swiping or whatever they're doing to get they, there's no communication at all at that point it's all i mean it's crazy that's why i wrote this book i wonder if you see it <laughs> little up oh yeah that's good <laughs> don't lie on your back for a guy who doesn't have yours <laughs> i love your title Thank you. I wrote that for our young women who they say they want to be married. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going to get married if you're giving it all away for free. Mm -hmm. It's the cow and the milk and the whole thing that our mom has taught us. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I so I tell them, and you know what? What the the one who really brought this out into the open for me is Cheryl Sandberg, COO no. of uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she brilliantly said that she has seen, and there are two parts to this, she has seen that the women 
are graduating from business school and I was, I'm now professor emerita of a business school. Mm -hmm. So I was in a business school for many years, teaching and training mostly young women because the amounts of women who are invo involved in MBA programs has swelled. Right. So I'm, I'm training them. Sheryl Sandberg said, so they graduate from business school with honors and then they decide, but I don't want a leadership position. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm going to have a husband, I'm going to have babies, and I'm going to because I don't, and I don't want to be thought of as less attractive and less capable because I am so powerful. Wow, we're going back. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't that that dates back to Colette Dowling's time <laughs> of the Cinderella yeah. syndrome mm -hmm. and my more recent book, Don't Bet on the Prince. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. They're still worried about how they're going to be seen. And in my book, uh, Don't Bet on the Prince, I talk about where is your locus of control? Is it the external or the internal? What is pushing you on? Uh, obviously, for me, it's the internal. Mm -hmm. But and so if I were so worried, at, at, as, uh, responding to that other question you asked mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. if I was so worried about what people are going to say about me, then I would be externally motivated and never have been able to get to where I have been get, uh, getting. But I am motivated by, and I, I do believe it's the greater good. I'm trying mm -hmm. to do what I'm doing. So Sheryl Sandberg talked about the women not wanting to take on these opportunities as leaders. Right. And she said it starts back home. Now, for the first time, finally, somebody has said, guess what? Your professional life is truly adjoined with your personal life. Thank you, Cheryl Sandberg. I appreciate that. This is what I've been saying for years and years. But I'm so glad she's out there saying that. So what I said to the women mm -hmm. is that you have to have egalitarian relationships at home so that you know how to be a force within yourself. Right. Not to be an intimidating B-I-T-C-H, but <laughs> that's what they fear. Uh -huh, right. To be a force unto themselves. So that's why I wrote, don't lie on your back for a guy who doesn't have yours. From the standpoint of an equal relationship, don't come to me for advice saying that, well, you know, I was friends with benefits for him. Because <laughs> I then have to turn to you and say, tell me, honey, where were the benefits for you? Uh -huh. And they go, oh, oh, hmm, ah. <laughs> and, and they realize they're not getting the benefits that they thought. Mm -hmm. well, so, so, so bottom line is I have taken that, that whole attitude, the personal, don't lie on your back for a guy who doesn't have yours, mm -hmm. and I combine that with my other book, <laughs> I have 17 of these, but we're not going through all of them. No, we, we should. <laughs> my other book, ah, one, uh, the business, this is my is. business book, One mm -hmm. Up Strategies Business Schools Don't Teach in How Not to Be Intimidating, to tell you where to sit in a conference room so that you are empowered without saying, ha ha, I'm so powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, all, how to shake somebody's hand. You don't get that in business school. You yeah. get... These are the, the innuendos. So mm -hmm. I have taken the first book and the second book, and I have combined them into one speech that I give in corporate America called Millennial Women Are a Business Asset. Well, that's an really interesting because I want to I mean, go back to how you, you got the Facebook uh, backing from all what you're saying and uh, as she's a leader and she's got that technology background, right? So I would like to know your perspective of how the social media pressure has impacted how not just women, but I guess everybody of how you said you don't fear or care so much what people think you could say whatever, but a lot of people do care because they're getting shamed on these social media sites. You what, know? What, what am I saying? What am I, I I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not saying, I'm not talking in you language. Mm -hmm. I'm when we do this, then we do that. Yeah. Um, I have another book. Which, <laughs> <laughs> I have a, 
journal. I, I'm sorry. I, I this is great. Ready. No, I love this. I, I knew we were going to have fun today. This is going to be fun. <laughs> I have a journal that's called my Rants and Ramblings Journal. That's, oh, yeah. the, that's the companion to Don't Lie on Your Back for, uh, for a Guy Who Doesn't Have Yours. That talks about each, each page is a different gildogram. Because when I was in corporate America, everybody said, oh, we look so forward to your gildograms. Mm -hmm. These are these aphorisms that you can remember and refer mm -hmm. when you're feeling like you need a boost of energy. You don't have to drink an energy drink. You can take one of my gildograms and the girls are telling me, oh, the tear stains are all over these books. <laughs> because, you know, one of the gildograms, for example, is... Uh, you will never be loved. I will never be loved if I can't risk being disliked. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's been what has motivated my life. Mm -hmm. I'm not risking being disliked because I like myself. Mm -hmm. I, I operate from a capital I. I walk my talk. This is what I am training other women to do. So this is mm -hmm. all, it's all so easy to me. It's, mm -hmm. it's so obvious. But we are lacking that one skill in between going for professional education and getting a job and keeping the job and ascending in that job, it's feeling good about ourselves that we deserve w to get to where we've gotten. Well, okay, let's say we feel good about ourselves but lack curiosity and we're just there. You know, I meet a lot of people like that. They just exist. They don't really grow. I mean, <laughs> I love the face. That, huh? I mean, they can't feel good about themselves. How do you get people to be, uh, I'm writing my book. I don't have the picture to show you. But <laughs> I, published yet. I can find another old book of mine. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I think um, it's really interesting to look at curiosity because that's what I think develops you into a much more interesting person and you somebody who maybe communicates better because they've looked into why it's important and they've, opened their mind to a lot of things. How do you develop curiosity? Well, I think you're right. I, I ask people, where is your sense of adventure? Yeah. Adventure? Wait a minute. What? <laughs> I think now, to me, every day, I, I, you know, I wake up, I say, what kind of adventure am I having today? Mm -hmm. Every day is different. Mm -hmm. And that's the curiosity factor. So if you don't have a sense of adventure, you may be dead before you realize that you're dying. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's most unfortunate. I have, I have met people in their 80s and 90s who have more life to them than some of these people who are just walking around the streets, uh, who are just, uh, you know, kind of existing. Yeah. And I think that at one point or another, when their life gets them down, that's where they have to ask that question that you just asked where is adventure in your life? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a sense of adventure, something is gravely missing. Yeah, it's a tough thing to, you know, and I'm trying to come up with a way to measure it and people to help them develop it a little bit. And it, it, it's really- that would, good. that would be a good measurement. It, it is, you know, it's, it, you look at some of the studies of what they do out there and you'll appreciate this since you're a doctorate, you know, and uh, just like I like to research, you like to research. It, if you look at what they're, how they're measuring it, they have little nine question surveys that really don't get any kind of data that I found very helpful. And I, it's one of those things you can't really put your finger on. And you represent the type of person that I think just loves to figure out everything. You want to, you want to go, you want to do, you want to. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't figure out everything. I, I can't. <laughs> I get help with techie things. I get help with financial things. I get get help with the things that I'm I'm not good at. Right, and we can't all be good at everything, you know. But I think it's good to push ourselves a little bit to to look into things that we maybe never thought of exploring. And I love all the different areas that you've explored. And I think that so many companies could benefit from all of your knowledge that you have because it's just a mass I, I, if i had listed what you had done we would be still doing your introduction right now <laughs> <laughs> i have done a lot um you know i was always in such a hurry my mom said little girl in a hurry always but at one point or another you know you turn around and you say okay so what is this all about is this about making money is this about 
um, making an impact in the world? Is this about, yeah, and I want to do all of those things because I want to be the role model for young women and older women. Women who, I, I remember uh, Wolf Blitzer said to me on air, on CNN once, he said, so Dr. Gilda, I know you used to be uh, training anger management and you gave that up in corporate mm -hmm. America because the people were too angry. I said, <laughs> yep. I said, yeah, I too want to be surrounded by positivity. Mm -hmm. And if I don't find it, mm -hmm. and if I can't get anger out of people, mm -hmm. then I'm, I, I, you know, I don't want to be in that environment. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to be doing my healing work. Yeah. So I'm at a point in my life now that I'm picking and choosing, saying no. I, li I, I drew up a whole list of no's that I was saying, when the, Hollywood when the Hollywood moguls came to me while I was doing the Dr. Gilda show pilot, and they said, here's another show we want you to do. And I looked at it and I said, you know what? I, I don't think so. And they, they wanted to, um, for that one, they wanted to pair me up with a particular show host who I had already worked with and I thought I didn't like his values. And I said, nope, I don't want to do it. And uh, this one Hollywood guy said, do you know people would cut off their cut off their right arm? <laughs> you have a show like you have two shows now. They would do anything to have this opportunity. And I said, doesn't thrill me. Mm -hmm. I want to do one thing at a time. Good, right. well, right. You know, I want to be good for all the people. I want to do it well, and uh, I want to focus on that. Uh, so yeah, I've had. I I, I now write a long list of no's that I have said because I, um, there's only so much time and there's only so much energy that anybody has and I really want to focus on things I know that I can help and heal. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you said yes to being on the show today. Um. <laughs> Okay, is it over? Well, it's going to be as soon as you can oh. share uh, how. Um, we never even talked about. We know. Oh, what, what do you want to talk about? We did, you, did we miss something you'd like to include? We never even talked about the sexual harassment things. Oh, I, mean. I know. We started that and then we did. Yeah. We'll have to have you back on. I, uh, <laughs> I, listen, I talk for a living, so beware. <laughs> I, I love this. This has been great. But can you share with everybody how they can reach you? Because I'm sure everybody's going, wow, how can I hire her now to come speak for, to come consult? How can they, they find you? Thank you. It's very simple. DrGilda.com. D-R-G-I-L-D-A.com. That's my website. Um, we're starting to revamp the website oh that is such a horrible isn't it i mean I, that is such a horrible thought so i've left this old website up for as long as i've left it up but push is coming to shove i'm gonna have to redo it but on there there's a contact drgilda.com d-r-g-i-l-d-a.com and i'm very available let's talk oh well thank you so much for being on the show it was so much fun oh, and you are such a joy i i oh. can't wait to just have some happy hour with you. We are soon. So I'm <laughs> <gonna> <laughs> and uh, we'll be back right after this message.